so Gilles, uh, Gilles is up next. Uh, he already uh, did this talk in uh, French earlier this afternoon here in France, uh, but now this is the English version, which will be a closed caption in English, uh, uh, FYI. And so Gilles has been working for the Wikimedia Foundation uh, for some time now. He's the co-founder and head of the performance team there. If Wikipedia is so fast, uh, it's probably thanks to him. So yeah, congrats. Uh, I'm really glad to have, uh, we're really glad to have him back this year uh, because he also spoke at last year's uh, We Love uh, We Love Speed conference uh, in Lille and uh, it was an amazing talk like this year. So yeah, without further ado, I'll stop talking and leave it up to Gilles. Hi, my name is Gilles Dubuc. I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I run the performance team there where we focus on making Wikipedia the fastest website possible. And today I'm going to talk to you about some research I've been conducting in the past two years to further the field of web performance monitoring and to look at performance from a different perspective than uh, what has been done so far by the industry. So. Typically, there are two main categories to performance monitoring, synthetic testing and run data, field data. So with synthetic testing, you will run tests locally, simulating the experience of a web visitor coming to your websites and uh, extract measurements from video recordings of what happens. For example, speed index with web page tests. And with field data, typically what is called real user monitoring run data, you will collect passively metrics that your web browsers can provide for the visitors that are currently viewing pages on your website. So I, I tend to compare those two web performance monitoring categories to the fable of blind people touching an elephant where you know the one touching the trunk will think that they're touching a tree and so on, and none of them will figure out that they're actually touching an elephant. Like it's easy to forget when you focus on specific web performance metrics that the category itself, run or synthetic, is only giving you a partial view of what the user experience actually is like. And so I went back to the drawing board and tried to think of what else could we, could we measure to complete this picture of what it's like to experience performance on the website. And so I decided to do some original research and I contacted uh, researchers from a university that had published um, papers about performance perception before and I offered to collaborate and that resulted in one study that turned into two papers and I encourage you to find them and read them, uh, especially the latest uh, version of it. And what that study consisted of was to ask Wikipedia visitors in different languages what they thought of the performance of the current page that just appeared, whether the page was fast enough, the three options being yes, no, and not sure. We did that for over 60,000 uh, visitors. And once we had all that data, we studied it, and we tried to see what findings we could extract from it. So I'm not going to cover everything that we discovered in that study. You can read the paper if you want, um, but I'm going to talk about the main findings. So first of all, in terms of establishing the validity of this study, we looked at whether there was any selection bias in the respondents of that survey. And that's very critical because if there is a big selection bias, then the data is basically impossible to interpret. Um, typically, people um, you know, give the example of online review websites where somebody is going to write reviews about restaurants, for example. And the fact that it's more likely that somebody is unhappy about their experience will leave uh, comments about it. So we wanted to check in this case, was it more likely or not that somebody with a bad performance experience would respond to the survey compared to someone who didn't. And so we compared the corpus of run metrics. We collected actually dozens of them. And in this case, this is page load time being, being shown in this particular graph. And we looked at the distribution of page load time between um, visitors who saw the survey and decided to answer it, who self-selected to answer the survey, and those who decided to ignore it and just continue with their browsing without answering the survey at all. And we discovered the distribution of page load time was the same between the two corpus, which shows that there was no 
self-selection bias when it comes to raw metrics between users that decided to answer the survey and the ones that didn't. And that's very important. It's basically the gateway to this study being meaningful because we have demonstrated that the fact that the answer of the survey itself did not have an impact on the answer. Then we tried to build a machine learning model to reproduce uh, the opinion that people entered in the survey. We thought that if we could build a good enough machine learning model, we could basically stop running the survey and just apply the formula that gives us the human opinion on the raw RAM data that we're collecting already. So we collected as, as many RAM metrics as we could from dozens of APIs, put them in a single machine learning model and try to reproduce what people uh, answered in the survey based on that. And the best we could achieve was about 0.6 precision recall. Um, so if we were just to flip a coin to get the answer of, is this page fast enough, yes or no, like if we randomly flip the coin, our precision recall would be 0.5. If we had a perfect model, it would be one for each. So it's better than random. Like we've, you know, this run metrics can allow you to approximate user opinion a little, but it's not enough. And it shows that like it might be a disappointment at first to think, well, this attempt was a failure. We can't build a machine learning model that reproduces the, the human opinion, but it shows that run data is so incomplete that you cannot reproduce what people think of the performance based on that alone. And I think that's what makes this study really interesting. It shows that collecting user opinion is really important because it gives you signal that is missing from RUM or synthetic data. You just cannot know for certain whether people would be happy with their performance experience based on the metrics that we currently collect. So that shows that this new category, the human metric, is very important. So after this initial study, we thought, well, now we have this well-tuned microsurvey, we might as well just keep it running and actually put it on more wikis. So that's what we did. And nowadays, we collect more than 20,000 responses to the microsurvey per day. So basically, every three days, we have as much data as this original study. This mostly comes from French, Russian, and Spanish Wikipedias. Historically, those are language communities that are more, op more open to studies and experiments than English Wikipedia, which is why uh, English Wikipedia is not part of the study or this continuous monitoring. It really has become the third essential way that we measure performance beyond the hundreds of synthetic tests that we run continuously to check the performance of our websites, the millions of run measurements we collect constantly from our visitors. We now also continuously collect the human opinion from this microsurvey. And it gives us a signal that is sometime, sometimes different than what we get from RUM or synthetic data. So late in 2020, I was able to look for the first time at the long-term trend of our performance changing because with all the events that happened this year, we had record traffic, like we had the highest traffic to Wikipedia of all time with the different lockdowns that happened. And we also had some meaningful variations in our performance over time due to various events in our infrastructure. And so that, that was interesting because we tend to be very stable with our performance. And it's the first time that we were able to see a meaningful change where performance worsened over some weeks and got better during others and whether that impacted the responses to that survey or not. So this graph, which is for French Wikipedia, uh, shows the black line is the satisfaction ratio. It's the percentage of people who in the micro survey answered yes. Um, and the blue line, uh, the thin one, is the page load time, in this case, the P95. And what we see here is that those lines really follow each other over the course of the year. Like it's actually an inverted graph for the RAM data, like the, the blue line like the, the score goes worse as you go low on the on the graph. This was just like to make it easier to show the correlation between the two lines. If you were to smooth those curves, it would be even closer. Now for French Wikipedia, it's really close. For Spanish Wikipedia, we see this correlation in movement and direction. When one goes up, the other goes up. Maybe not by as much, but they go in the same direction. And the same for Russian Wikipedia, where there was an improvement at some time, like an improvement of performance for a few weeks. And actually the satisfaction ratio increased by more than it did in previous uh, similar events. Our theory for this as to why sometimes the amplitude is different 
is that we're only looking at page load time here. And page load time can change for many reasons. You can have a higher page load time because your initial TLS handshake was slower or because you had a first bank happen later or because one of your images displayed was uh, a straggler and you know loaded late compared to the other ones. So I think um, the difference in amplitudes might be coming from the fact that those are different uh, improvements or regressions in terms of nature. It would be worth studying exactly what happened during that period, digging into the specifics of what changed to understand why the amplitude might be different. But I think it's already very interesting as a finding that the direction is correlated, essentially meaning that if you see your survey satisfaction ratio changing, then you might worry if the, the other metrics don't move. It might mean that there's something is happening, but it's not necessarily captured by the other performance metrics that you're collecting. So this is where we need your help. Um, this study and this monitoring has only been done on Wikipedia. And I think it's very critical that the same studies or similar ones are attempted on other websites that are of a different nature. Wikipedia is a very fast website to begin with. We don't have as or third party content. So in some ways we're very different than the rest of the web. And so it would be very interesting to see if the correlation or lack of correlation between microsurvey asking users what they think of performance and run metrics or synthetic metrics uh, are any different on other websites. So I think it's really would be really useful for the rest of the performance community to look into this subject matter, to, to explore the area of human metrics of asking users what they think of our performance to see if we can reproduce those findings or if we can discover um, new information on other websites. I think it's also very interesting as a way to validate whether new metrics are worthwhile. Like you can compare what this new metric tells you to the human opinion and decide, is this new metric worth collecting? Is it giving us new information? Is it giving, is it giving us information that's closer to the human opinion? So some quick advice if you want to venture into this and ask your users what they think of your performance. When you do a micro survey like this, it's very critical to randomize the order of the possible answers. It's been proven that when you have um, you know, multiple choice answers, people will tend to have bias towards the first ones that are listed. And so it's very important to shuffle the order so that you don't have any ordering bias in the responses that people are gonna pick. The next thing, of course, as I've mentioned, is to be really, really careful about making sure that there is no self selection bias in the people that decide to answer your micro survey. You might want to try out different phrasings for how you ask your question or how you bring up your possible choices in the answers. It's really, really critical that you ensure there's no self selection bias for people who decide to respond to your survey or if there is to really understand it because it can really invalidate a lot of the conclusions you will draw from this data if by nature only some people will decide to, to, to respond to the survey. To that effect, it's also very important to, to study the context, not just the responses and the performance metrics, but also the page content. Was this um, a page on your website that is more likely to make people upset, for example? Uh, did people access it from home or from work, depending on the time of day? Did some global events like uh, going into a lockdown or leaving one might affect the mood of your visitors to the point that they might give slightly different answers because they're not in their normal mood. And then the context was in the session. This is not something that we did in the study or in our monitoring, but I would like to do, which is that we were looking at page loads in isolation, like just randomly one in every thousand page loads. But I think it's really critical to look at the whole session of a visitor. Maybe that particular page where you asked them the question with the survey was one that was slower than the ones that they experienced just before, or vice versa. So it's really, really critical to look at the context in their session. What were they doing at the time that you asked the question of what they thought of the web performance of that page? So thank you. Uh, I thought. Uh, like, I hope that was useful uh, for you, and I encourage you to ask me questions, and that we're going to go to the live session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gilles. Yeah, Hello. Gilles can, you, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, I can.
Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so we're in the Q&A session right now. Uh, we had a new question from uh, an English speaking uh, viewer, uh, which we are going to get to now. So what metric were you using on the RUM and synthetic tests? Why not LCP rather than page load time? So synthetic tests were not part of this study, but the people that I work with had done uh, user-centric studies with synthetic tests before and not got great results in terms of correlation between user opinion and what synthetic tests could collect. So this was RUM only. Uh, why not LCP? LCP came out in 2019. It was not available. It was impossible to collect it on browsers at the time the study was done. Uh, we probably collect it now. Um, that being said, for Wikipedia content, most of the paint timings, first paint, first contentful paint, as well as large, largest contentful paint, tend to be the same uh, because most of our traffic is on articles where there might be at most one image above the fold that's usually fairly small, and it tends to be uh, rendered by the browser during the first paint. So that's why for us, it wouldn't make a huge difference to switch to another paint timing. For other websites, it probably would make a difference, those that are more image heavy. Uh, but for us, those timings are so close to each other. Like we saw in the study, like basically you're asking which ones we used. We used every possible timing that navigation timing gives us, resource timing, first paint, uh, and even run speed index, which is a hybrid that collects things from resource timing to try to approach what speed index gives you. Um, so we basically tried everything we were collecting at the time that we could collect in 2018. Uh, now, since then, I've taken a glance at newer ones, and I've never seen new metrics that were closer. But we don't collect everything that's available. Like, for example, we don't compute CLS, but we do record layout shifts. So it might be worth doing another study of this data with layout shifts to see if there's a correlation between the presence of layout shifts and negative opinion. But I haven't had time to do this. Uh, but it's definitely worth benchmarking every new metric that comes out against this existing data to see uh, if somebody, something is better. Uh, in, in our case, it was page load time that correlated the best, uh, which sounds odd because it's old fashioned. People tend to dismiss it because it takes into account a lot of things that are below the fold, but it, it just had a much higher correlation uh, in our case. And my theory is that we might be um, kind of focusing too much on above the fold when nowadays people don't really wait to start scrolling on your page. So in a way, this view of What's above the fold is really artificial. In, in real life conditions, as soon as there's content, people try scrolling, especially for Wikipedia, where the bulk of the text will be available. So they can start scrolling right away, you know, whether the images are there or not. Um, so I think it also depends on the nature of the website. Some websites, maybe above the fold matters more than others. Thank you very much for the detailed answer. Um, we have, uh, I think we have a new question from uh, Anthony, uh, if JP, you can bring it up uh, in here. It'll be appearing in a second. Yeah. Uh, do you have information about the satisfaction of the user after responding to the survey? And does asking the question influences how they felt about that experience? Um, so we don't track people. Uh, so we didn't, we don't know if we asked the same question multiple times to the same users. So we can't see like the evolution of their opinion over time. We, this just anonymized page views. As for whether the question influences the opinion. Um, so I, I, I went over that a little bit, but we actually dug deeper. So we looked at a lot of different scenarios, um, where people, for example, they would see the survey and not answer, or they would not see the survey because they scrolled faster than the survey appeared and just didn't get a chance to see it. And the last one being that they saw the survey and responded. And last scenario was that they saw the survey very late to the point that there was no way they could remember what the page load was like. Like maybe they saw the survey like five minutes after the initial page load. Those who ended up filtering out, we saw a lot of junk in that. Um, like there was simply no way people could, could give us an honest opinion. They, they, especially since they didn't know we were going to ask that question. So that was the only filtering we did is we removed any very late answer uh, when people answered like 10, 15 minutes after we asked. 
Um, so we don't think that influence, the question influenced the answer because the distribution of run metrics and not just page load, page load time, but with others that we looked at was identical between each corpus, people who saw the survey, people who didn't see the survey, people who saw it and responded, people who saw it and didn't respond, which suggests that the question itself does not sway their opinion. Otherwise, we would see some bias of some kind if asking the question influenced them in some way. Thank you so much. We have uh, some time, uh, very quickly, maybe a minute or two, for uh, another question that was actually asked uh, for the first time uh, in, in French, but uh, we all found the answer very interesting. There was one from uh, Boris. So on Wikipedia, are authenticated users saying uh, the same thing as non-authenticated? Did you measure the satisfaction difference? Absolutely. So we, we looked at a lot of different um, slices, like people with bad devices, people who are logged in, and people who are not, uh, when, when all of this is in the paper. So the, the logged in uh, case was very interesting. It was very surprising. So to give a bit of background about our architecture, uh, we have our own CDN. And we have uh, points of presence in different countries. So when you're just reading Wikipedia and you're logged out, you get to the closest data center. So if in Europe, in Europe, you reach our data center in Amsterdam. If you're in Asia, you reach our, our data center in Singapore. But if you're logged in, it's a different story because we have not yet been able to convert all our backend stack to work across multiple data centers. And so you would be hitting our main data center if you're logged in because for editing and things like that, you want things to be in sync, right? You don't want to make an edit in some part of the world and it doesn't appear somewhere else. Meaning that if you're logged into Wikipedia, you have a performance penalty right away, unless you happen to live really close to the data center in the US. So if you're in France and you connect to, uh, you log into Wikipedia, instead of going to Amsterdam, which is really close in terms of latency, you'll be connecting for every request to one of, of our data centers in the US. So that clearly adds latency and the experience is objectively worse if you're logged in. Like if you look at our all our performance metrics, uh, client-side performance metrics, they're all worse for logged in users uh, on average. And so the interesting result was what the, the, these people think in terms of their response to the micro survey about performance. And it turns out that it's the opposite of what you would think. They're actually happier about the performance that they, that they experience, which sounds odd at first, but they're a couple of possible answers as to why. One is there might be some affinity to the project. If they're logged into Wikipedia, they're contributors, which means they like the site, like it enough to bother registering, logging in, and contributing to the encyclopedia. And so maybe they're going to be a bit kinder to us when they're responding to the survey compared to somebody who's just passing by, reading an article, and doesn't really care about Wikipedia, or might even know what Wikipedia is. Um, and they would also know that we're a nonprofit. They know that we're uh, running with less means than uh, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. And so they might assume that, okay, for a nonprofit, maybe that's good enough performance, for example. The other theory, which we haven't verified, by the way, neither of those, is that um, since they're frequent visitors, they know what the typical performance for them normally is. They're, they're used to that level of performance they get from being logged in because every day they're logged in, they're contributing, and they, they know that's what they get. So when we ask them the question, what do you think of this page load, they probably think of it more in comparison to all other page loads that they experience, uh, which if they're an editor might include some really slow ones, like actually saving an article. Like if you're making a change to a huge article, uh, it's going to take some time to save, like maybe a couple of seconds. And so in comparison, just reading an article feels fast. And so there are lots of factors there that might explain why logged in users are happier about worse performance from objective standpoints. So that's a really good point. And we like it's been a long term goal of ours to make the performance the same for logged in and logged out users because it's really <laughs> annoying for us and frustrating to know that we're penalizing people who actually contribute to the encyclopedia. But it shows that if you're going to do a similar study on your own website, you might want to have some extra questions to check how much people like your site and maybe that might affect their responses. Like in this case, we only had one question in this micro survey, but you might, if you want to dig into that, like kind of know where people stand in regards to you before they even answer the question, you might want to ask extra questions to know, like, are they being kinder than they should be just because they like us? There was actually a really old study in the 90s about this, 
where people were asked to rate the performance of different websites that were made slow on purpose. And people were uh, more forgiving if it was a small local business. Like if it was a, a local restaurant that had a slow website, they were forgiving. If it was Google that was slow, they were not forgiving at all. <laughs> and so that, this is something to know as well. Like what, what, what perception of your brand do people have? Do they expect you to be fast? Do they expect you to go above and beyond with performance? That's really important. So I think it, it's, it's useful to have this context when you're doing a study like this. Thank you so, so much, uh, Gilles. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure to have you both times today. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know if you, you plan to stick around a bit on the Slack uh, to answer possible other questions or to give more details. Uh, uh, and otherwise, where can people find you, uh, like on Twitter or? Sure, reach out to me on Twitter, on the Slack. I'll be happy to answer more questions or give advice, whatever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.